2 Chronicles 35. Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the fourteenth day of the first month. All right, here we go. Here's another Passover. Here's another king that's doing right. And this time, everything was prepared. Everything was done on the proper time. Well, his great-grandfather had done the Passover, and they were unable to keep it at the proper time because, you know, the tabernacle wasn't clean. The priests were not dedicated. So Josiah, if he's been taught history, if he's been taught his grandfather's ways, probably he's already, you know, realized his grandfather was unable to do it at the right time. And maybe he double shift himself to make sure everything be ready at the proper time. And he set the priests in their charges and encouraged them to, to the service of the house of the Lord. Now, he's not intervening into the priest's office, but as king of the nation, he's making sure that the priests are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, he's not ordering them, as the fact is he's telling them what to do. He's just telling them, say, listen, you have a job to do. Get going and do it. And said unto the, uh, there's, a, there's a church out there, an organization, the Roman Catholic. You know, they want to intervene and they want to control everybody by means of their priests. They're the ones who want to start wars. And, and, you know, they're the ones that can turn around and cry priest. I mean, peace. Peace. The king is not interfering with the priests, and the priests are not interfering with the king. But they're working together. And said unto the Levites that taught all Israel. So Levites were to be the ones that taught Israel. They're the ones to make sure Israel do to God. Bring back the history. Bring the law of Moses. Make sure everything, you know, what they're supposed to do. When they're supposed to do it. And how they're supposed to do it. The Levites were the who, what, where, when, and why. And which. Today, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1, we're the priests. We're the kings. We put too much stuff on our pastors. It's not the pastor's job, I'm sorry. Pastor at best will get a family, if he's lucky, four hours a week with an open Bible. A Sunday school teacher is not her job because she'll get that child at least one hour a week. The Bible states that if a wife has a question, she's not to go to the pastor. She's to go to, she is to go to her husband and ask him the question, and he's to find the answer out. I'm sorry, but the Bible states that the man, the husband, and the father of the house is the one in charge of teaching his family. It even shows in, in, the, in the law that Moses told the fathers, you're the one to mind your children. When your children come to you and ask, why do we do this? You're to give the answer. And we're in America today to the fact is a lot of fathers are absent. A lot of children don't even know who their father is. And when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to the Bible, most of the fathers are not even saved. If they are saved, they're not even in church. And they're in church, they're not even in the Word of God. How are they supposed to guide their family? You know, they'll tell the, the woman, the, the mother, the wife, Take the kids to church and, you know, and then he expects that pastor, that Sunday school teacher, to bring his family up spiritually and while he goes about mowing the lawn with everything. Now, I know that Le all Levites are not priests, but all priests are Levites. But we're called as priests. We're the ones that are supposed to teach our children. We're supposed to study the Word of God. We've got every convenience in the kitchen. We've got every convenience in our bedrooms. We've got every convenience in the car. we got every convenience in the living room. But yet, we don't have time for God. <clears throat> and when, when there was a time as a farm when they're out plowing from sun up to sun down, when mother had to make dinner from scratch, The family knew more Bible than they do today. And you can get a Bible in practically anywhere today. There's no excuse. Dollar stores have Bibles. Which were holy unto the Lord. 
Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, did build. Bill, wait, wait a minute. When did they move the ark? The ark has been moved. When and where? And why? And how? Uzzah went to touch the ark just because the ark stumbled and God struck him down. Here the ark has been moved. It had to be, you can assume, moved by the priest. Nobody could just walk into holy, the most holy place. Unless they were just so defiled that God said, go ahead. I don't want to be in any re reference to what you guys are doing anyway. With all the sin that's been going on in this in this tabernacle, all the sin that's been going on in Judah, and all the sin that's going on in Jerusalem, God's like, go ahead, get me out of it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And it's sadly today, a lot of the churches, God's like, I have nothing to do with that. Yeah, they pray in my name. Yeah, they mention my name, but I never sent them. Imagine a lot of people who are going to stand at either judgment and they're going to have to give an account to say, thus saith the Lord, and God never said nothing to them at least. Somehow this ark was moved. Shall not be a burden upon your shoulders. Oh, Josiah knew the law. Josiah knew the the history. He called back when David brought it the wrong way and, and Uzzah was killed. He's like, you guys bear, bear it on your shoulder. Now, either he knew the law or he knew the story of what happened to David. But he knows one thing. That ark belongs a burden on the shoulder. And when you read back, I believe it's First Kings eight eight and Second Chronicles five nine. I got the reference here. Was when they brought that ark in the holy place, Solomon had the staves taken out, and they said that the staves were put against the wall and were seen without. They had to put those staves back in to move that ark out. Makes you want to think. Serve now the Lord your God and his people Israel. And prepare yourselves by the house of your fathers, the lineage, each family of the Levites, each family of the priests had a specific doing. You couldn't just have any priest go carry that ark. It had to be of Kohath. That was the family assigned to the ark and the holy holies and stuff. After your courses, According to the writings of David, the king of Israel, and we went through all that through Chronicles. David has set up different courses. You find that courses show up in the book of Luke, chapter 1, where John the Baptist's father had a course. And it was just every month there was, a, there was a certain amount, a certain set, a certain family that had a certain job that David was allowed to perform by God. Makes it orderly and fashionably done. And stand in the holy place according to the divisions of the families of the fathers of your brethren, the people, and after the divisions of the families of the Levites. So he's saying, everyone get ready, everyone do, be where you're supposed to be. So kill the Passover and sanctify yourselves, prepare your brethren. That they may do according to the word of the Lord by the hand of Moses, the law. The Passover hasn't been killed yet. He's saying, you guys make sure you do what you're supposed to do. And make sure you sanctify. And you better make sure you do it by the word of Moses. He's, he's, he's giving them a warning. He's giving them, listen. If you're going to do it, do it right. And Josiah gave to the people of the flock 
lambs and kids, all for the Passover, offerings for all that were present to the number of 30,000 and 3,000 bullocks, these were of the king's substance. Oh, Josiah provided everybody with a Passover lamb. You go back to Exodus and read, it says everyone was to have a lamb. And there was one case that if your family was too small for the fam, lamb, you could go next door to the people there. Josiah makes sure every family has a lamb. He's looking out for the people. And you know God approves of this. He's so sorry of what's going on. He's so in love with the Lord. He's like, I want to provide for the people. I want to do it. And maybe just because maybe there's a family that can't afford it. Maybe there's a family that doesn't have it. But he wants to make sure that they have the needs that they have. You know what your job is? The Bible says in Revelation, aren't we kings too? Doesn't say about, I think it's about verse 7 to 9, something like that. We're priests and kings. As king like in the Josiah, aren't we supposed to make sure all the people of Ormond Beach has a lamp? At least an opportunity to have a lamp. It's not recorded, but you just imagine somebody refusing the lamp that Josiah offered you know it happened you tell me 100% of the people in, in, in Jerusalem 100% of the people in Judah and 100% of the people that came down from Israel every single one of them received the lamb you, you believe that I don't I believe there's some people that know I've got my own religion I'm going to stick with Baal or I don't believe that God I'll do it my own way or that won't work And that's what happens when you witness in your city, when you go to your neighbors. I got a lamb, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that John the Baptist said, Behold the lamb, the lamb of God, which take away, the sin, take away the sin of the world. You take that to your neighbors, you take that to your people in your city. Because you're a king. Where's the priest part come in, according to Revelation 1? Because we're kings and priests. When they say, yes, I'll take that lamb, and then you do with the Bible, the word of God, what you're supposed to do properly, properly handling the word of God, you perform the sacrificial lamb that God provided, the sinless lamb, you provide it in their life so that they can have the blood and be washed. Again, not everybody's going to receive that lamb. Now, what would happen if these priests, or one of the priests, took the lamb and just did it any old way he wanted to do? God would not accept it. The person that brought it would not be accepted by God. What would you do if, if you just took, you know, just believe this? Say this prayer. God will not receive it. It's not properly done. What if you're going to take salvation and add a little bit of world to it? What if, say, by instance, you bring a pig and offer the pig for a sacrifice? God's not going to receive it. Well, listen, it's a four-legged animal. I give it to Christ, and God say, take it back. That's not what you're supposed to do. So Josiah preaches what we're supposed. We are supposed to make sure everybody has opportunity to that land, even though not everybody's going to accept it. And we better make sure by the priest that they do. He says, you do by the book of the law of Moses. We do by what, what God, how God showed us to witness, and according to scriptures, that make sure that we follow the scriptures on how they're to be saved, and to make sure they're saved by the right way. And we don't take no shortcuts. Like the devil wanted me to do a couple weeks ago. 
And yes, I fell into that. I was going to do the easy believism. I couldn't believe it. This shows how much I get in the flesh, how much the devil will deal with you. Even when you know the Bible, even when you preach against something like that, the devil gets you down with, you know, love. Well, it wouldn't have been love if I said just say this prayer. We're priests and we're kings. Josiah shows us that we're to provide the lamb and we're to properly administer the lamb. Imagine you're in a hospital room, they bring you an IV bag, and they just tape it to your arm, the, the, the two. Well, I ain't going to do you no good. They got to insert it into your vein. The blood don't do you no good if it's not the proper blood. The blood don't do you no good if you put sinful blood into it. You say, can you take the blood of Christ and make it sinful? Yes, you can. I'm not saying Christ's blood is sin. I'm not saying that Christ is sinless. But you can take that blood and you can pollute it. Wasn't one of the things for the land that they were supposed to make, make sure that it was without blemish, without spot? What if you bring somebody a Jesus? Paul said there's another Jesus. There's another gospel. What if you bring an ill-fated sheep? There are people who come to your door and tell you that uh, that this that the, sh the lamb is not God. Well, that lamb is not God, then it's got sin blood. That ain't no good. Josiah gave to the people of flock lambs and kids, that's goats, all for the Passover, offering for all that were present, to the number of thirty thousand and three thousand bullocks. These were of the king's substance. Now, this is not just for the Passover. This is for all the offerings that needed to be. And his princes gave willingly unto the people, to the priests, and to the Levites, Helkiah, and Zechariah, and Jehiel, rulers of the house of God, gave unto the priests for the Passover offerings 2,600 small cattle. That's interesting. It says small cattle. Not young cattle, not calves. Small cattle. Why? I don't know. I don't know what the small cattle has to do. And 300 oxen. The princes give. The king set the standard. The princes look at him and say, hey, we're going to give too. Princes are usually sons of the king. And when a Christian goes out and tells people about Jesus Christ, he spiritually gets a child of God. When you witness to somebody, somebody turn, someone believes on the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are a child of God, but you are also a spiritual parent to that child, that newborn baby. And guess who it is up to to raise that newborn baby? Give them to the pastor in the church. No. Sorry. You better realize, since since we're an active evangelistic family, anybody comes to us and bows a knee and receive Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, we are obligated by the Word of God to offer to teach them and train them. Now, they're obligated to say yes or no. But these guys were taught, hey, we better offer too. You train a young Christian, a brand new babe, how to witness. In the state we are right now, Kaniah also, and Shemaiah, and Nethiel, his brethren, and Hashabiah, and Jael and Jezbab, chief of the Levites, gave unto the Levites for a pass offering, Passover offering 5,000 small cattle and 500 oxen. Now let me tell you something right now. We've already been to the book of Numbers. 
Right now there are people who are giving. God is recording it. God is telling you their names and he's telling you how much you gave. Now you try, are you going to tell me that God does not know what you give in that plate or that box? Whether it be tithes or offerings, whatever you think the church age is. I'll tell you right now, God is recording everything you give. If he tells you a difference of a small cow, an oxen, or whether it be an ass, or a kid, or a lamb, or you, or whatever it is, I will go so far, and you can, you can take this and throw it in the garbage can, but I also go far as the guy to say, listen, you gave X amount of dollar bills, you gave X amount of five dollar bills, you gave X amount of ten dollar bills. I'll tell you what I go so far as to do. You want to beat the ties? I'll tell you what I do. When it comes to the first check of, the, of the, our checks that come into this house, the first check number, I give it to God. That is my ties, my offerings, and extra help. If there's anything extra help into it, that first check written with the bills is God's. Before I even sit down and figure the bills, I look at how much we make in that month, and I figure out how much I owe God first, and that check is his, the first one. Then it's the rent and the electric bill and the boom, 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 boom. And you have the missionaries that we support and all that, they're towards the end. We want to make sure our bills are paid before we... And God records that. I believe, and you can take this to garbage, God records Stiley Hayward and his family. That first check is mine. Whatever it is, it's mine. Now, I can write all kinds of checks throughout the month, but when it comes to that time to do the bills, sit down and do the bills, that first check is God's. I do that purposely. I think there's only been a couple times where I forgot or something else. I wrote a check. God says the first. So the service was prepared. So that's where we get the word service. Service time, you know, be in this service. But did you count what the service was? You gave of your you gave of your own. You did what God told you to do. A lot of people go to service and they don't give nothing and they don't do nothing for God. Matter of fact, they think that, you know, they're doing God a favor. And the priest stood in their place, orderly fashion. They're not where they're not supposed to be. In other words, at the time, they're not out fishing. They're not, not mowing the lawn. They're not sleeping in. They're in their place. They're in their pew. And the Levites in their courses. They did what they were supposed to do. Not only were they there where they were supposed to be, but they did what they were supposed to do. According to the king's commandment. And they killed the Passover, and the priests sprinkled the blood from, the, from their hands, and the Levites flayed them. Now the meat, not the priest's hands. So the Levites did have part in the in the in the sacrifices. They didn't make the offering, but they cut the pieces off the how they're supposed to. Now with the generations that we have corroded today, your mom and I would would remember the fact is this is what you would call a butcher. And yes, I remember going to the grocery store where there was a butcher. And you could tell that butcher, I want a specific part of that animal. And he'd chop it right there and put it in a, a wrapper, like a grinder wrapper they wrap it up in. And then you bought it like that. It wasn't prepackaged or anything like it is today. Your butchers were Jewish people. Because they come from a long line. They had to cut that meat just right. They had to prepare that meat just right. And now it's a dying breed. 
And they removed the burnt offerings. That would be the cattle, the, uh, the, the kids, the oxen. That they might give according to the divisions of the families of the people. To offer unto the Lord as is written in the book of Moses. So did they with the oxen. And they roasted the Passover with fire according to the ordinance. That was Exodus 12, 8 and 9. But the other holy offerings saw they in pots, boiled. It was in a, a, like a broth kind of thing. That's what sod means. In cauldrons, that's a big pot. And in pans. And divided them speedily among the people. After they were properly prepared, then they gave to the people to eat and take part of it. Remember Eli's sons, he, while it was in the pot, while it wasn't even finished yet, they go in there and take that three-pronged thing, boink, and they'd take up raw meat that wasn't fully cooked, which is a violation of the law. But they got so many people they're taking care of, they're cooking this meat every way and any way they can. And get into the people to make sure everything's performed like it's supposed to. It was supposed to be eaten in haste. And afterwards they made ready for themselves. And for the priest. Because the priest, the sons of Aaron, were busied in offering the burnt offerings and the fat unto night. Therefore the Levites prepared for themselves and for the priests, the sons of Aaron. So as priests that we are, we are to take care of others before ourselves. That's not just a, a New Testament that Jesus spoke. Others, you know, Jesus first, others next, and you last. That was an Old Testament thing. The priests took care of themselves last and made sure the people had enough and had everything they were supposed to have. You know, you wouldn't have poor saints. You wouldn't have Christians under welfare if they would follow this thing and make sure they took, other, took care of others first, then themselves. What do you read in the book of Acts? When they got saved, they sold all their houses and gave the portions to the church to supply the needs. And then when it said that there was um, famine, I think it was, in the home church of Jerusalem, the churches that they supported sent relief to Jerusalem to help them out. I think America is going to be like that. I think the missionaries that we send out, they better support us when we go going through the famine. Because we are going to go through the famine. There's no question about it. It's just when. You know America ain't going to keep on going in God's eyes the way we're going. And the singers, the sons of Asaph, were in their place, according to the commandment of David. David set up the singers, remember. And Asaph and Heman and Jethuam, the king's seer. And the porters waited at every gate. They might not depart from their services, for their brethren and Levites prepared for them. So all the service of the Lord was prepared the same day to keep the Passover, and to offer burnt offerings upon the altar of the Lord, according to the commandment of the king, Josiah. And the children of Israel that were present kept the Passover at that time. And the feast of unleavened bread seven days. There was no Passover like to be kept in Israel. From the days of Samuel the prophet, neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept. And the priests and the Levites and all the and all Judah and Israel that were present and in the habit and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You say his great grandfather kept the Passover. What about that? Hezekiah did it. Hezekiah couldn't keep it at the right time. It was a month late. The Bible records that you go all the way back to Samuel. And no one since Samuel had done right but Josiah.
In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. And all this, when Josiah had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Carchemish by Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. He went to go fight against Egypt. But he sent ambassadors to him, saying, What have I to do with thee, O king of Judah? Thou king of Judah, I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherein I have war. For God commanded me to make haste. Notice the capital G. The God of the Bible thou shalt not kill. Told this king, I want you to go against the, the Euphrates, Charchemish, whatever his name is. I want you to go conquer him. Now in order for Egypt to do this, he's got to go through Israel. And he's marching through Israel and Josiah's like, hey. Strike up the band. I want part in it. And the king of Egypt said, No. Your God told me to do this, but don't you join part in me. I have nothing to do with you. I just got to pass by you. Got any supplies? I need supplies. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him, and hearken not unto the words of Nico from the mouth of God. So Josiah disobeys a man that God told to go do this. And not only did I tell you to go to Chemimish of the Euphrates, you tell my king, stay home. And came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. Oh, that's interesting. That's Armageddon. And the archers, that's something you need to pay attention, the archers. Armageddon. Um, I can't think of his name now. Over there in Genesis chapter 10, uh, was a famous Nimrod. Esau was an archer. And the archers shot. Pay attention to archers in the Bible. At the king. And the king said to his servants, Have me away, for I am sore wounded. You didn't belong there. I'm going to say it over and over again. If you're not where you're supposed to be, God's going to strike you. God will whip you. God will punish you. Be, be very careful where you go. And God, before he gets you whipped, gets you wounded, he will tell somebody, he will send somebody to tell you, don't go. His servants therefore took him out of, the of that chariot and put him in the second chariot that he had. Well, I don't know why they switched chariots. Maybe his was destroyed, or maybe the other one had faster animals, but they switched chariots. And they brought him to Jerusalem, and he died and was buried in one of the sepulchres of his fathers. And all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for Josiah. He died for disobeying God's word. And all that he'd done. God told him not to go. And Jeremiah. Oh, we're getting to the end times. For Judah. Jeremiah's around. You read the book of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah lives through the captivity. We're getting to the end days. For Judah. Lamnay for Josiah, and all the singing men and the singing women spank of Josiah in their lamentations to this day, and made them an, an ordinance in Israel, and behold, they are written in the lamentations. So they write songs about this guy. 
People must have loved him. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and his goodness, according to that which was written in the law of the Lord, you know he disobeyed, and his deeds first and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And you can follow his life in 2 Kings 23. You got to read both together to get the complete story. You know, you can say, "Hey, I got a great time with the Lord. Look at all, look at all the Lord had me to do. I, you know, I got all the people right. We witnessed. I provided a land, and one little thing of disobeying God. I'm going to say it like this. I'll explain myself. Josiah committed spiritual suicide." By not listening to God. God told him not to go. Had Josiah stayed home. He would have more chapters in this Bible. Than what he has. Josiah is an example of what I teach. You could commit spiritual suicide. Josiah definitely died before his time by rebelling against God. Again, had he listened to God, had he not gone, he would be still alive today. Well, not today, I meant where we're reading. If he was still alive today, he'd be one old man. He could put the candles on his cake, be brighter than the sun. Don't think you're so wonderful, you're so great in your life that nothing will happen to you. We don't even know why he wanted to go. We're just told he wanted to go. Where God didn't want him to go. And he dies. For all have sinned and come short of glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. Man, he died.